Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Rosanna Francescato, Communications Director with the Clean Coalition, and we are excited to host this webinar today on the critical role of local solar in achieving 80% clean electricity by 2030. On the heels of COP26 and with less progress than we'd like from our federal government, it's important to remember that we have climate solutions available now and studies like the ones we'll cover in this webinar are key for moving forward the policies that we need to deploy these solutions. So before we get into that, a few quick housekeeping items. We will email everyone the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. Also, all of our webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org, under events. If you have questions at any time during the webinar, please go ahead and type them in the question pane at the right of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A, which will follow the presentations. And if you have any questions about the Clean Coalition, you can contact me at rosanna at clean-coalition.org. <clears throat> and speaking of the Clean Coalition, I want to start by setting the stage for today's webinar, including who the Clean Coalition is and what we're about. The Clean Coalition is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid. Our end game vision is that we will get to 100% renewable energy within the next two decades. And I know you all get how important that goal is. At the Clean Coalition, we're focused on the 25% of that end game that we believe needs to come from local renewable sources. And I should say, that's at least 25%. There are places already uh, around the US and around the world that have gotten to more than that. Uh, I do want to clarify that the Clean Coalition does believe we'll still need to get up to 75% of our energy from remote sources. So there is a very important role for remote energy generation and the transmission system. But local renewables provide significant benefits that remote generation just can't provide, like local jobs, resilience, and cost savings. And the transmission system is incredibly expensive. In fact, transmission costs are absolutely out of control throughout the country. They are the fastest growing component of electricity bills in California, where transmission already costs about the same as the energy itself. And soon it could even cost more to move energy around than to generate it. And this is partly because of how the market is designed. Transmission is guaranteed a pretty crazy return on equity of 12%. There's no other investment we know of where you can get that kind of guaranteed return on equity. And this outdated business model creates massive market distortions and conflicts of interest, like the transmission access charges distortion in California. And it leads utilities to make spurious arguments for building out more transmission when it's often not needed. And I want to point out quickly that transmission costs are much higher than they seem because when you add operations and maintenance plus the ROE, transmission costs go up 10 times beyond their initial capital costs. And these costs are borne by ratepayers. Again, you'll get these slides um, after the presentation. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna move ahead, but there's lots more information here. So transmission costs to ratepayers are huge and growing. And in California, we have a huge market distortion in the way that transmission access charges or TAC are metered and assessed. And that means California ratepayers are paying more than they should for the transmission system and local renewable energy projects are disincentivized. So here you see an illustration of the distribution grid and the transmission grid. And TAC are the usage fees for the transmission grid. In California's investor-owned utility service territories, these fees are being metered and assessed incorrectly at the customer meter as shown here. That means you can't tell whether that energy came from the solar rooftop next door or from a power plant a thousand miles away. They're treated exactly the same, regardless of the fact that the remote energy used a transmission grid and the locally generated energy didn't use it at all. Now, in municipal utility service territories, on the other hand, TAC are being metered and assessed correctly at the substations between the high voltage to low voltage transmission lines and the low voltage transmission lines to the distribution grid. So that's the substations you see here. So the way that TAC are being assessed in IOU service territories just doesn't make sense 
It's like paying extra shipping and handling fees for something you picked up next door or paying a toll for the Golden Gate Bridge if you pull into your driveway at home. You may hear a lot of talk about cost shifts these days, but this is a real cost shift happening in California. So we have to fix this. And we have to fix it not only because ratepayers are paying these costs, but also because TAC distorts the market by making remote energy generation look a lot cheaper than it is. Three cents per kilowatt hour is being stolen from local renewables, which makes them look more expensive. And these charts show how that's happening. You hear a lot also about economies of scale of utility scale solar compared to rooftop solar. And in the chart on the left, you can see how when we ignore the transmission costs, remote generation does indeed look cheaper. But when you transport that energy over the transmission grid, you have additional what we call shipping and handling costs oops, um, associated with that transmission. And that comes to that three cents per kilowatt hour. Now, once we fix the tack distortion and make transmission costs visible, then local renewables look a lot more cost effective, as you can see here in the chart on the right. And you get resilience and many other benefits at no extra cost. So since overall transmission costs are increasing rapidly, TAC, of course, are also increasing. And in 20 years, TAC are expected to be at 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour. That's where we get that levelized cost of TAC at 3 cents. And that 3 cents is about 50% of the average wholesale cost of electricity in California. So that's a huge amount. The Clean Coalition did a deep analysis on this, and we found that if you fix the TAC market distortion, we'll end up with a lot more local renewables over the next 20 years. If we continued with business as usual, um, we would get to about 12% local renewables. But if we fix TAC, we can get that to over 30%. So also, if we do that, we will save Californians over 60 billion over these 20 years, and of course, we'll have much better outcomes for local renewables. And I want to mention that this is not just theoretic, theoretical based on our analysis. We actually know that deploying more local renewables can save us money. In CAISO's 2017 to 2018 planning process, they already deferred 2.6 billion in planned transmission spending, in large part because of an increased deployment of local renewables, as well as increased energy efficiency. So how do we fix TAC? Our proposed reform is relatively simple. Only charge transmission fees for energy delivered through the transmission system and have procurement reflect both the energy purchase price and the delivery charges. There's a lot of support for this reform. We've gotten nearly 90 organizations to sign on to our campaign so far. We're actually at 89 right now, and we're making progress on legislation. If you'd like to join in this work or sign on as a supporter, please contact me or go to the links shown here. And I want to point out that TAC may seem like an obscure issue, but it's really key to deploying more local renewables to reform the system. And this will lower costs for all ratepayers. In fact, in our next presentation, you'll see how deploying more local renewables will actually save us billions of dollars while meeting the Biden administration's clean electricity goals. So we're lucky to have an excellent presenter back with us today. Carl Rabago operates Rabago Energy. He has more than 30 years of experience in energy and climate policy and markets, and he's recognized as an innovator in utility regulatory issues relating to clean and distributed energy services and technologies. And you can read more about Carl on the event listing for this webinar on our website. And again, we will send everyone the link to that, which will include the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. So now I'm going to turn it over to Carl to continue our presentation. So let me just Thanks, Rosanna. hold on a moment here. Uh, sure. And I will take care of that. I trust you. I trust you. Okay. I'm excited to be. It's been, it's been <laughs> fun watching the, oh, let me say, so show this window. Yep. Okay. It's, um, it's fun. I've been watching the participants counter go up. I feel like I'm, you know, we're, we're about to reach that level, folks, where we, you know, anyway, the pledge drive is working. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to join me um, and and for for hosting me for this discussion. What This presentation is about work that builds on work that we've been doing for really over a year now on trying to understand what a least cost future 
our electricity grid can look like. And we've had the chance to model, to use this powerful modeling tool that Vibrant Clean Energy has developed with, with participation from a whole bunch of stakeholders um, to model the lower 48 a couple of times in several different ways. We've, we've modeled California, Illinois, we've modeled New York, those results are out. And um, we're learning from the consistency of the pattern of the results that, uh, that there are opportunity for saving money while achieving clean electricity goals and clean economy goals is robust, meaning it's everywhere. And we can just have, what well, we have to do is have policies like the tax reform policy that you just heard about. We just have to have policies that enable us to grab those benefits. So let me take you on a walk through uh, what a supercomputer can do if you bring it to the grid. And uh, perhaps for the one of the first times ever that supercomputing capabilities have been brought to grid analysis and projection. We are talking about trying to figure out whether or not we can achieve President Biden's vision of 80% clean electricity by 2030 and more. But I'm going to focus on 2030. I want to make this very crass in terms of political policy issues because it's a near-term focus. I want to guarantee you that there's more information at Local Solar for All that um, at, our, at our website um, under the news story about with a full report out to 2050. But I'm going to focus on the first less than 10 years now to show you that um, not only is this a great deal, but it's a great deal even in the short run, and it's, it, which means that it only gets better as we go along. So what did we do? Well, we just asked the basic question. We said to the model, look, model, you're a lease cost model. You do production cost modeling, meaning what is the least expensive resource I can choose to meet the next increment of demand, and also capacity expansion modeling, which means what are the next resources I need to acquire and add to the grid in order to keep the grid working and, and reliably provide for everyone's demand for electric services? And how can we do this all at least cost and achieve President Biden's objectives? Um, we are faced with a argument, with a debate, if you will, the sort of the the famous way in which in which modern media and dis policy discussions seem to crystallize into this or that, we are faced with this debate of, well, should we do it with these really big utility scale renewable energy investments, or should we do it with distributed resources? And hey, trust your intuition. Uh, you know the answer as well as I do. The answer is both. We need to and our way to a clean energy future, not oh, not follow an or path where we choose who's the enemy and who's the winner. Um, we can achieve 80% clean electricity reductions by, by uh, 2030 and 50% economy-wide reductions in carbon dioxide emissions. And we can go on by 2050 and electrify our entire economy and eliminate carbon dioxide emissions at lower cost if, and that's the question we want to answer, so how, what, what did we learn? Well, if we turn on the juice, yeah, bad pun, but if we turn it on in the model and say, take advantage of our distributed resources, by 2030, we need to add 100 gigawatts of distributed solar rooftop and community solar across the United States. That will drive 137 gigawatts of distributed storage capacity, a big down payment a doubling and doubling again of our distributed uh, uh, generation and distributed storage capabilities. Actually, our distributed storage capabilities are very small outside of places like California. So we really have to grow that from zero. But if we do that, it will in turn drive big amounts of utility scale solar, big amounts of utility scale wind. It'll save $100 billion in just that short time frame. It will add over a million incremental jobs because these are labor intense resources. And if we then take advantage of these savings to deploy these resources to, to provide benefits to low and moderate income houses, we, households, 
we can make life better for eight to 15 million LMI households by targeting these resources where we go. And like I said, um, we're, these, these are things we've learned in our model and things we're learning from other models uh, by the Department of Energy, by the Solar Energy Industry Association, by our own previous analyses. We need to step on the gas, bad metaphor, uh, in order to accelerate our progress towards our clean energy policy goals. But we can save money if we do it and if we go with distributed resources. So how does this all work? Well, let's start with the baseline, right? The current state of our mental furniture is that our default assumption is that only large scale resources are, quote, cheap enough to rely on for achieving such a dramatic change in the way we make and use electricity. And that's a, in, that intuition has some historical grounding. It used to be that the bigger you built a power plant, the less expensive the electricity uh, was that came from it. And we do know that building a big utility scale solar farm produces less, less cost per incremental unit of energy production than putting them on our rooftops. After all, you're gonna pay for more labor to put it on your rooftop than in you just covering a field with solar. Um, it's so, but that's not the whole story. We used to think it was the whole story, but most of the reason we thought it was the whole story is because we had no capacity to actually model the small side of the grid. Everything on the right was just too complicated in, uh, to, to really do a job modeling and utilities didn't really care about it because all they wanted to do was build large scale resources. A lot of that mental arrangement of furniture has not changed, but this model compels a different way of thinking about these things. This model suggests that if we stop having old ideas, as Edwin Land said, the inventor of the Polaroid camera, Maybe we can have a new idea. And if we have the tools that enable us to an analyze all our options, maybe we'll come up with different answers. So old models, we used to do things like they would, they would take the weather for the last 30 years, they still do, take the weather for the last 30 years, come up with average weather, then they'll take that to inform expected demand, then they fix that, and build large scale resources to fit. They would increment this on 8,760 hours a year, which sounds like a big problem, especially if you're doing it for 15 or 25 years. And they would put it into a model that looked at resources that came in chunk sizes of 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts that came once every hour, like I said, and that were added somewhere in the system with some kind of static value added for the cost of transmission and distribution. Um, not a very dynamic way to go, but once upon a time, rough justice, reasonably accurate because the only thing you wanted to do was big system investments. Um, that didn't look at those options on the right as choices, as therefore as resources, and that's the most important thing we changed when we went to Vibrant Clean Energy and we got to use their wisdom model. We opened up the frontier between the large scale system and the small scale system. We built, they built a computer that was capable of analyzing 10,000 times more data points that took things down to a resolution of three square kilometers, not a whole state at the time, took it down to one kilowatt, not 50 or 100 megawatts, and took it down to five minute increments, not 8,760, but 105,120 time increments in every year. By the way, for the cool kids, used to have to know 8760, I'd say to be really cool now, you gotta have to know 105, 120. So commit it to memory and everybody will know you're an energy geek like me. We break down the barrier, we look at all those options, we can right size our resource selection to match our demand and more, I'll tell you about that in a moment, but we can right size our resource selection, which means better fit gives us better economic efficiency and more savings. 
We can plan, sorry about the poodles, we can plan for the total system at the same time. We can ask not just how, what is the least cost of energy production, but also is it still the least cost option when we add in the transmission and distribution necessary to actually serve a customer's load? And we can do all this in a way that takes the best advantage of all resources on both sides of the old system divide. Our, with that capability, we have been asking a lot of questions of this model. The question we ask here, to place it as starkly as we possibly could, was, is this concept that we have to do this all with utility scale resources really the least cost solution? So we, we, we ran the model to achieve the top four policy objectives were exactly the same on the left and the right. 80% clean electricity by 2030, 50% economy-wide reductions in CO2 by 2030, 95% economy-wide carbon reductions by 2050, and economy-wide electrification of thermal transportation and electrical loads by, well, they're all electrical loads now, by 2050. And turn on the optimization capacity of this model, as well as take advantage of local solar and storage as resources. What is local solar and storage? I want to make sure I define the term for you. We're talking about any solar that is deployed below the 69 kV interface, that white line in the previous diagrams. We're talking about mostly rooftop, but also community solar. We're talking about the small scale stuff that doesn't need to be charged, those tax charges, as you just saw in order to get its electricity to load pretty much. Although there's an opportunity for moving that electricity throughout the entire system, of course. Um, we're talking about, by the way, we also, the model also looks at other resources like um, DSM. Uh, because the model is trying to solve for utility capacity, it doesn't select as much of that as it is trying, as it will select of a generating resource but those resources are in there as well. What did we compare that to? Well, we compared it to saying, the heck with this, turn off the local solar and storage engine. Not a realistic assumption, but the assumption that would allow us to really test the economics of large scale utility resources. We said, turn off that optimization function and turn off additions of local solar and storage after 2021. If it's really less expensive to build a utility scale system, then let's do it. If not, how do we optimize our local solar and storage to take to get least cost? What did it do? Well, when we turned on the local solar and storage optimization function, as I said to you at the start, it said, please build a lot of cumulative distributed photovoltaic capacity, rooftop and community solar and also to complement and to enable that resource as well as complement and enable utility scale resources you need to add 137 gigawatts but doing both of these charts will be cost effective because you will save over a hundred billion dollars nationwide now when i say save the way this model works and the way all these models work is that it assumes everyone pays for everything. So that $110 billion, $110 billion in savings comes about if there was no private dollars, no individual customer dollars flowing into the system. Of course, we know that's not true. There are always those good citizens who figure out a way to invest some of their own hard-earned money into improving things at their house and in their community any of those investments increases the value of the savings even further but we just took the bare minimum baseline everybody has to pay for everything there are no volunteers reality is there will be volunteers and these savings will be even bigger if we grow the system in this way and what does the shape of that savings curve look like well What's nice about this is that you save from day one and you save all the way through this planning horizon out to 2030. So politically speaking, this is a really good deal. 
And like I said, it doesn't include those contributions made by private customers. It doesn't include all the very real benefits that we could get from things like siting this, these facilities where they can create more jobs for economically distressed communities, the reduced pollution that comes from displacing fossil generating units, all the so-called social benefits that come with a clean energy transition. Um, and this is just out to 2030. The benefits are positive every step of the way. Um, and we could get more benefits if we were willing to be more aggressive in our pursuit of those policy objectives. How does it do it? This is the part where I get really excited thinking about how the grid is changed by just the size of the resources that we target. The top half of this diagram shows you utility scale thinking only. This is a select number of hours uh, out of the total system so we can really zoom in. It's the high peak cost summer months uh, in our total sample. And what you can see is that the utility scale generation on the left has to chase constantly changing distribution demand on the right. That constant chasing is what adds cost to the utility system and burdens power plants that would just like to run smoothly, right? That's the challenge, it's just it's peaky. And when it's peaky like this, the entire system varies and that variability adds cost. So the very first thing that utility store, solar and storage does, and this squares with our reality, is it smooths the load that the utility system sees. Now your generation units get used more efficiently. They get used more, they, they get more value out of their usage because we brought up the bottom on the right hand side of this lower corner here, the distribution demand with optimized DER has got less gap between the peaks and more time when the entire system can run smoothly. So this smoothing the load function generates a huge amounts of economic efficiency benefit. It just lets the system run better. And that's good for everybody regardless of whether you're able to afford to invest in community solar membership or rooftop solar investment uh, because everybody's total system costs go down the second way in which savings are created is because these local solar and storage assets shape the load they change the shape across all 8760 hours 105,125 minute increments in a year. Looking at the top of this chart, what you see is the shape of utility system service, if you will, the demand on the system across all the hours in the year. That demand is very high, but and fully high, needs the entire system less than 10% of the hours in the year. This needle peak nature of the shape of demand is the biggest cost driver. And it's what everybody goes after. It's what demand response is really good at. It's what summer peak load solutions like distributed solar are really good at. It's what batteries are really good at. And it's what everybody has been focusing on because that's where the really high costs sit. You know, the costs rise as you go up on the vertical of this. But here's what's really cool about local solar and storage. It doesn't just trim the peak, it changes the shape of the overall load. The blue is the savings and the reshaping that occurs with local solar and storage. And by reshaping, it flattens. So now the gray area plus the dark blue is a much flatter line. That's how factories and grids like to run pretty much at the same level all the time. That's how you keep these excess peak costs down, but also keep total system costs down. And it does that, these local solar and storage resources do that by changing the shape of the load that the utility side resources see. And because they see a different shape of load, we can actually get more value out of all our utility scale resources. So we get better utilization of utility generation by having 
more local solar and storage, which itself is more carefully and precisely meeting demand. That's a better formula in whether you're running a factory, whether you're running a grid, whether you're trying to do anything, that's a better formula for economic efficiency. And that's why the model squares with common sense thinking about how we can make improvements to the grid while achieving our policy goals. How does it play out? Well, this capacity chart shows you how things change just in the time to 2030. Coal is removed, it's economically, it's dying a death of economic causes already. Gas is substantially reduced, both the gas turbines for peaking use and the combined cycle plants for kilowatt hour generation. We depend on more wind and more utility scale solar. There's a, still a good market for the utility scale folks, but we've added important diversity at the top of this, these chart lines, these, these uh, bars that adds robustness and better tailoring and fit to the entire system. That bigger bands of different colors on the top, on the right side of this optimized local and storage bar is what ends up changing. So we don't have to tear down the whole grid and build a new one. We just have to introduce these better, more precise resources in order to achieve savings across the entire grid while building out our utility scale resources as well. What does it do? Well, in addition to achieving those results, it also achieves fantastic growth in just dis distributed solar and distributed storage jobs. These jobs, by the way, don't go into that $110 billion savings. They're additional, just like those dollars that are saved if people bring their private investment into their own solar participation, what, however they do it. These are incremental benefits and jobs create benefits, especially in local economies that we achieve beyond just the cold hard math of utility system costs. So again, if you wanna get President Biden and our country's vision of 80% clean electricity by 2030 and all those other objectives, you need, we need to step on the pedal and really speed up our movement towards distributed solar. We certainly need to stop doing reductions in distributed solar or gutting net metering policies or other things like that. We need to accelerate our deployment and capacity for absorbing and deploying uh, distributed storage. We need to keep the engine moving on our utility scale resources. And then we will have $109 billion of savings just by 2030 as an insurance policy against bigger goals that we wanna achieve later on. We'll get the benefit of additional jobs. And like I said before, we can deploy these tactically as well as strategically to achieve and deliver benefits to low and moderate income households, um, just like we've learned in this study and other studies. So wrapping this up a little bit here, what we knew before is that distributed solar was the most charismatic energy resource in our lifetimes. Well, now we know that local solage plus storage is even more to get excited about. We can get benefits out of it, as we already knew, but we can actually complement growth of the entire system and save money while achieving our policy objectives. But we can't be shy about this. We must commit to a cleaner future if we want a cleaner future. We have to, um, as somebody, as somebody once said, or and I can't remember who I copied it from, but we have to take a sustainability approach. And sustainability really means believing, means really believing that there will be a tomorrow. If we believe there will be a tomorrow, this is the time to invest in the policies that will enable us to have more local and solar and storage across the 48 states in the US right away, not waiting for 2030, not waiting for 2040, certainly not waiting for 2050 to achieve it. Along the way, we can probably figure out with those savings and with the other things we learn how to achieve other important policy goals, like really, really zeroing in on Justice 40 goals, making sure the benefits of this transition go to low and moderate income neighborhoods that have been too much overlooked in the past, while 
achieving the transition on building electrification and transportation electrification as well. Um, so the policy here sums down to do no evil, uh, do no harm, don't take off the work, accelerate the support for this transition, it will pay you, us back in the near and in the long term. And states, because they control so much local regulation, need to also participate in this transition. Um, with that, I can open it up to questions and we can have a discussion about what we learned in our latest modeling. Again, Local Solar for All, if you go to the news page, you'll see the release about this study and other studies we've done. And at the news page for this study, you'll also see hyperlinks for getting to the written narrative, a uh, copy of this presentation, um, and lots more information about who's with us, uh, who's supporting this effort as we get the word out about a true roadmap for a clean energy future. So, Rosanna, I don't know how you want to handle the questions. You want to pitch them at me? Do we want? To I, I will do that. Thank you so much, okay. Carl. This has been great, and I love how you're both inspiring and also presenting a lot of facts. And, and I do want to ask one question before we get into the audience questions. Sure. Uh, this model is clearly the most sophisticated model to date. Um, how does it uh, compare with or how can it work with models that are being used by the folks who are planning what happens on the grid at the California Independent System Operator and the Public Utilities Commission? That's a, that's a really, really good question. So I said, okay, what do I do, right? I have a Monday morning question. It's like, okay, now what do I do? Um, as, a, as somebody who has been a public utility commissioner in the past and, and has other fun roles in the electricity sector, I, I came away from first be, meeting this, the, this modeling capability and the results of this analysis with three big takeaways. And, um, one of them zeroes in on the question you asked. But the first big takeaway I want to say is that a lot of policymakers have been stuck, have been unreasonably forced into um, that old mental model that they have to choose between big and small. And it's not fun to do that when you're a policymaker. And, and what this model says is it's not necessary. Um, I'm not being so naive as to say you can have your cake and eat it too. Right, because we do, we have to be intentional about this, and we have to make sure that we grow these distributed resources, um, and and that does mean different things to different people. But this is an and solution. The utility scale and distributed scale, a lot more distributed scale, is necessary. The second one that comes away from this is that that hundred million, hundred and ten million dollars generated in this model, which translates into hundreds of billions, 100 billions uh, by 2050. And a share of that in every state that pursues this pathway um, is really the kind of outcome that we have not seen in the utility space in a long time. For the last, you know, my entire 31 career years in this business, things have seemed to always be getting more expensive. And a new power plant always increased rates. This is an opportunity to actually reverse that trend by going to a clean energy future. And that's worth paying attention to. That's, it's also worth thinking about what could you do with that 100 billion? Could you target it more effectively to those low and moderate income neighborhoods? Could you accelerate particular kinds of technologies or R&D? There's, there's a budget there. Could you just keep it as insurance against things not working right? There's a budget there that we've had, a discretionary budget that we've never really had. That makes it worth pursuing all by itself. And now finally to your question. Um, I cannot believe that in, during my entire career, and if things do not change for the foreseeable future, we will be making billions if not trillions of dollars of resource investment decision based on pl plans that are developed from a single model owned and operated usually by one single entity. And even the good faith attempts in like, for example, the net metering debate in California, to get everybody talking across the same modeling platform has pitfalls because we use this kind of least common denominator approach. We, we use the model that everybody can agree does at least something, but it doesn't explore the real opportunity. 
So what the PUC, CAISO, the, the California Energy Commission, and their counterparts across the United States should do is add this kind of analysis to how they look at their planning. Don't ignore it, complement it. Run two different models. It doesn't cost that much to do this. Um, we run another model and see where the differences are and understand how complementary they are. Hold your assumptions the same, but show what better modeling can reveal and use that to inform your policy. You know, there's in the utility space, probably the biggest question that ever shows up and that informs everything about what utilities do and what regulators have to watch out for is like the return on equity. What is the profit that comes to a utility when it makes investments? Because that means they can attract shareholder dollars. It's sort of utility regulation 101. Well, I can tell you as a regulator, that setting that return on equity is one of the most powerful and important things you do. And no regulator would ever do that based on the results from one model. So we use discounted cash flow. We use we use um, cap on the, the uh, models. We use uh, expected earnings models. I've seen rate cases where four or five different models were brought to the same set of facts, so that regulators would have a real understanding and a better ability to predict the future. That's what this model does. And that's what these regulators and policy organizations should do. They should bring more modeling analysis and analysis so they can make better decisions. Long-winded, but it gave me a chance to get in a couple other points I wanted to make. Yeah, that's great. I think we all agree that they should do this. Have you had any interest from any of these agencies in this model? We're, we've had people allow us to make presentations to them. I know that I've talked to some, um, uh, some people that have said that have accepted these modeling results in proceedings, like integrated resource planning proceedings or rate case proceedings. So there, we're finding ways, we're using the tools of regulatory intervention, public interest intervention to get this information in front of them. Um, I'm hoping that uh, they can, that, that state energy offices and regulatory commissions can take advantage of some of the support dollars that may be available with the new infrastructure bill so that they can improve their capacity for, for, for you know, doing as best a job they can as predicting, but not only predicting, but charting their future with this model. And we stand ready to work with any of them uh, in doing that. I will also say fiber clean energy, the, the, the guys, guys, the team that owns this model, they do a lot of work for a lot of people. And uh, we at the Local Solar for All Coalition, you know, don't control them and don't know. I'm, I know they have clients we don't know about. Um, I know that some utilities are asking for this model so they can understand how their, what their future could look like. Um, and hopefully everybody will get smarter, um, even if, some people are, you know, don't want to get smart in public. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, let's get into some audience questions. We have quite a few. Uh, Dana Hall Great. from the Law Offices of Dana Hall LLC asks, how will we facilitate the grid capacity, be it transmission or distribution level, to enable the necessary DER growth in the 80% goal? Most of this DER will be grid connected and expect net metering and the utilities have queues already that are multiple years long. And she says that her company has asked, um, or his, I don't know, the, their company has asked PJM to review a 10 megawatt solar project. And they have told us they will not have the time to review it until 2025, possibly as late as 2028. Well, uh, first, if it's the same Dana Hall, I think it is. Uh, virtual hugs, I miss you friend. Um, uh, although I will say I'm glad to be back in Denver, but I, but I miss, miss my old friend. Um, the, Dana's question asks a very good question. It's like, how do you, what do we do on the grid? How do, do we need a grid study? Do we need a grid infrastructure study? The good news about this model is that it does plan out what and account for economically what kind of transmission and distribution down to 69 kilovolt um, uh, resources need to be added. 
It looks at their current capacity. It figures out whether or not there's any more capacity to handle the shuttling of this electricity uh, that comes from these distributed resources, these utility scale resources. And it pays for those transmission and distribution upgrades as part of this total equation. So um, this is a lease cost that optimizes that as well. But below 69, this model does not do. There's a good debate about whether or not in utility production costs and capacity expansion models, we need to do that. But we do need to do it for distribution planning. So there are complementary counterpart efforts going underway with all the smart people like Grid Lab and others who are teaching us how to do distributed energy resource management, DERM, or distributed integrated resource planning or distributed energy resource planning, DERP. Um, we're coming up, as, as we do in this business, we're coming up with new acronyms every day. Um, so there, what we'll need to do is figure out how to do the handoffs of results between those two sides of the detailed modeling so we can really optimize the deployment. Um, I, I said it, I'll say it again just really quickly. Um, there, the, this kind of model will make investments in distributed in distribution infrastructure and then capitalize on those investments in later years. Savings increase and accelerate after 2030 and when you really start electrifying if you invest in distribution infrastructure today because you can serve that greatly increased load from more local resources and do more of that load shaping and smoothing. Um, so these, these models have, as we say, they have perfect foresight, but uh, they tend to be a little myopic. They solve this problem, but then they choose the best solution as they come along. And that in effect gives it the long range vision that we need. Great. Um, a few people have asked about different locations, and I know we did a webinar previously that was a model run for California, but I want to clarify this one was a national model, correct? This was 40, the lower 48 states, you know, which is sort of all you could argue are all connected to a similar grid. Uh, we'll just talk about Texas in another time. Um, and that resolution goes all the way down to that three square kilometers. So I've seen like when we did um earlier runs last december you know we had uh we, we could have we could have asked for data results for every single county in the united states so you can you get that kind of resolution and when we did california you said rosanna we 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 actually were able to track the projected job growths and other impacts by county um, that can be done by running the sort of the full model on this thing and uh, all the way out to 2050. Great. So since this was a national model, obviously it doesn't mean that this only works in California, where we have a lot of sun. This is a model for everywhere. That's a that's a really good point. Um, yes, this is the na this is a national model, and it assumes a certain amount of getting along. Uh, you know, between states, it'll it'll say that gee, if there's a Good transmission line, and there's you know a sort of hardly used transmission line, and some good open space. Maybe that'd be a good place to put a solar plant or a wind uh, farm, and then move the electricity to load in a bigger center if it's possible. Um, when you start isolating by state or re region or even utility. You tend to, the way we tend to do this modeling is we we tend to reduce the range of our options. Uh, one of the things we were really interested in learning when we started doing state runs was would it ever go upside down? We haven't seen that yet. I'm pretty much ready to say that optimizing distributed energy resources will yield savings anywhere you do it because of this basic way it operates. But um, What's the EPA slogan? Mileage may vary with usage. It depends on how you choose to build out your grid. And remember, a lot of this is also, you know, comes home to roost, right? If you put the brakes on distributed energy resources, unfortunately, like some states have, uh, you will lose the benefit of these savings. 
uh, you, you know, you have to take advantage of these resources and pursue a lease cost plan. And if the utility is grousing about it, from my perspective, we need to figure out ways that utilities can, can, can do better, but not stand in the way. Uh, the things we did in the past should not be used as an argument for not building a better future. Absolutely. Um, Marcel Howiger, staff attorney at TURN, has a couple of questions. Yes. When you discuss distributed resources, especially as modeled by VCE, are you discussing wholesale projects, retail rooftop solar projects, or both? How do the VCE assumptions apply to wholesale versus retail? I think you covered this somewhat, but do you want to talk about that a bit more? Yeah, so, so we're talking about the technical scale size here, and I'm not making any assumptions about sort of, if you will, offtake contracts or, you know, getting paid PERPA rates versus getting paid net metering rates or anything like that. The way the, the way these models work, like other production cost models, is that you enter the cost of that resource and you select for each increment of demand, you select starting with the least cost resources and work your way up until you've satisfied all the demand. Uh, by selecting from your menu of resources. So we cover the cost for each incremental unit of kilo, kilowatt hour of production in each time slice as necessary. Um, and we're not making decisions about sort of how the compensation is configured or how that, how that system works. We just say this is the revenue that that facility needs in order to be cost effectively deployed, just like, you know, a plexus model or anybody else would do. Great, and Marcel also has a question about the relative contribution to the demand shaping of local solar versus local storage. He asks, is it fair to conclude the benefit derives primarily from storage? And a couple of people had questions like that. Yeah, and the answer would have to be no, because uh, the cost of the energy that goes into the storage, the storage definitely gives you this sort of the flexibility to output when you want in order to maximize value. But the electricity that goes into the storage that charges the batteries has its own cost. So, you know, if you're if you're going to discharge a battery, if you want to say time shift some electricity from noon when the sun is up everywhere in the state, let's say, and you want to serve a load at 7 p.m. by taking advantage of a storage device, you can fill that battery with electricity from 200 miles away, bus bar cost plus transmission cost plus distribution cost, or you can fill that battery with local solar. So yes, the storage is the pretty face, the his sort of the flexible face on serving the load. It's the last thing, if you will, the load sees. Uh, but what you fill it with is economically significant. And what this model enables us to do is to ask those system questions, bus bar cost plus transmission costs and distribution costs uh, for each increment of charging that is done. And that maximizes, that improves the value of that storage as well. Great. Um, David Kay from Cornell University asks, do you have information that breaks down the subcomponents of transmission costs uh, to help us understand what elements makes those costs so high? And he looked for something more detailed than the summary of report that you have up. Where could you find more detail, including the results of the New York modeling that you mentioned early on? Yeah, um, the, I'm, I think the New York modeling is already up at the web. Go to the news pa uh, page at Local Solar for All. There is a summary uh, narrative for each of the individual reports we release. There's also a link, uh, if not there, but just go directly to Vibrant Clean Energy's website, and you can find the comprehensive uh, documentation. And I'm talking a couple, uh, probably a couple hundred pages, real happy geek stuff. I mean, there's like Greek letters in there and all sorts of formulas and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that that explain how the wisdom model deals with all that all those things like the transmission o and m transmission capex and all those other factors um, i don't remember what i've read about it 
Um, so I, I won't say anything specifically. I'll just say, uh, now you've given me a reason to go back to that document and make my head swim again. Okay, so we should look there. Um, yes. James Dodenhoff, principal at Silent Running LLC asks, what assumptions does the model make about ownership of utility scale generation? Does it matter whether utilities own utility scale assets or does the model change if there's private sector ownership? And you talked a little bit about DER, but what about um, utility scale? It does not. It assumes that the resource has a cost and that whoever uh, operates it and delivers energy from it requires a certain amount of revenue in order to do that. So it, remember, it's that you know. Remember how these production cost models work, right? They, you know, they sit there and they say, "Okay, next time slice. What's the demand? It's a hundred. Okay, who will give me a hundred? I don't have a hundred. I'll give you seventy-five, and this is the lowest cost. Take it. Okay, I've got five more, and the next highest cost. Take that, and take that, and take that." until okay i've got a hundred thank you very much next time slice and they just do that iteratively throughout all the time slices that they have to solve for uh that's a very crude simplification of how they do it but it's sort of the basic function um so in this case it just asks what can it be built for um uh, and uh assumes prices that come out of things like the nrel atb uh, which tell you what the incremental cost is for that resource and assumes that somebody provides it. Who gets to provide it is a po important policy question. Uh, yeah, I just just filed testimony in a renewable portfolio standard case in in Virginia, where that kind of question is squarely on the table. That's not what was analyzed here, but it certainly deserves analysis. Is a PPA a, a you know less cost? What is the value of utility control over the construction and operation, all those kinds of questions are execution questions that the model doesn't really get into. So now you actually, I want to thank you because next time I talk to Chris, I'm going to ask him, hey, can you, can you enter those variables and give us some optimization strategies for utility owned or, you know, market resources? And um, if I, if I learn anything good, I'll make sure we, I'll, I'll try hard to get a study that shows it. Great, thanks. Um, here's one I love, Timothy Sh Schokel, um, CEO at Smartham Laboratories Limited asks, what is the value of community resilience that utility scale solar cannot provide? And I guess really the question for you would be, was that kind of uh, value modeled at all? I'm, I'm expecting <laughs> probably not, but uh, we also have our own answer for that, which I will uh, give to start this out, Good. that the Clean Coalition has developed a methodology for valuing resilience, and I will send out a link to that. Um, but oh, our value oh, of resilience me methodology allows you to value resilience at any facility or in, in any community on a larger grid scale. Uh, it's there are a lot of different entities have tried to do this and made it super complicated. Um, but ours is a very simple and yet effective way that we've used in the real world. So I will send that out along with all the other materials. Um, so you know there's so, definitely yeah. a huge value to of re resilience to local renewables that utility scale cannot provide. But was that kind of value modeled in any of these studies, Carl? Not, not explicitly, no. And and I, I look forward to looking at your work. And this is another topic for conversation. How could you put in parameters that would grab that? By the way, for for folks, you know, res, quantifying and valuing resilience has become the current sort of cutting edge golden, you know, sort of holy grail um, because climate climate uh, weather driven weather extreme extreme weather events are are becoming more common and more destructive um and i'm so glad that you guys at the coalition have put together some some ideas on that i look forward to looking at them for those of you who have to have a conversation about it when we were talking about this in new orleans after um the last hurricane and um somebody just said it so succinctly uh you know resilience means the ability to take a punch and um, that means how quickly your system, how, how much stress your system can endure and how quickly your system 
can recover and how continuously your system can provide the benefits it's expected to provide. Um, it wasn't modeled explicitly in that in those terms, um, but I think that's obviously going to be a place where these models have to go. So I support the fact that you guys are looking at it, and I'm eager to learn more about how to do that. My comment was basically an extension of my years of work in this field. We documented uh, when we published Small is Profitable at Rocky Mountain Institute, we documented 207 distinct ways in which right size resources provide engineering, operational, financial, and economic benefits. And a lot of those could fairly be uh, considered related to resilience as we are now using that term. And I'd encourage you to look at what we found, even though the book is uh, now 15 years old, it uh, still has some really good basic principles and it's available for free on the web. In fact, I think I posted a link to the free copy on my robagoenergy.com uh, website. So you could even go short or just search for small as profitable. Great, uh, I will look for that. Those, um, yeah, yeah, those increments of value. Yeah, and I think what all this shows is that, you know, all of these models show huge savings and that's without even accounting for things like the value of resilience or jobs or of course externalities, which are really enormous. So um, do you have time for one or yep. two more, Carl? I want to ask this um, one. So wait, I think yeah, let me, thank you for asking because I just noticed it's 102 as well. Let me do a 100% confirm okay. uh, on my calendar and see where I'm sitting. Uh, What's today? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, well, actually, I'm in good shape. I'm in good okay. shape, so we can stay for a couple right. more. We have a few more, and I, I want to ask uh, another question about what's in the model. Claire Broom is asking, does the model identify the locational benefits of DER? Is that something that is considered? Right, not, not, this, not as finely as we would like, um, it, you know, because it, 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 it'll tell you where you should put DER for maximum system-wide benefit, right? So it says, I need another increment. I could, I could get it from here. I I'll put it here and then it'd be really good because I'd have the lowest total system cost. We, we don't really know, for example, like the jobs benefits. We make some high level assumptions, especially when we looked at the, the, the New York state. So that'll be a place where you can, sort of see where we tried to do this. We overlaid economically disadvantaged areas on the output map of the analysis and showed a really good overlap of distributed energy resource deployment and those communities. We operate from an inference that that is good for those communities, uh, but you know, there's a, that, that inference bears examination at the local level, right? Because we've cited facilities in people's neighborhoods in the past, thinking it was good for them. And you really can't answer that until you talk to people. So uh, you know, there's a certain humility that has to come with this. We assume that the incremental jobs appear in the area where the facilities are sited, but we uh, obviously we know that somebody may commute. So you have to make adjustments for how deploy, how labor deploys in support of resource deployment um, and understand that in your community as well. For example, you know, uh, New York City needs a lot of distributed generation, but there's a whole lot of people drive a long way to get or take the train a long way to get to New York City to work every day. And you'd need to make those sort of localized adjustments. Uh, but, but you could tell where the resources need to be and that enables you to have a discussion about whether that's good for folks and whether or not you want to therefore pursue that for maximum system value. It's sort of a locational DER benefit. Um, and we just have to do it with our eyes more wide open about the environmental justice, energy justice implications of those decisions. Great. Um, Tim McGeever, solar project developer at Sunline Power, asks, have you looked at the impact of vehicle to home slash grid 
as a multiplier for energy storage deployment. And that makes yeah. me also wonder, you know, have you looked at um, how energy use is expected to increase? Yeah, I'm not sure that this assumes that those electric vehicles are anything but load. Uh, so I don't, I'm sure it considers them destroy, distributed storage. I, I don't think so, but I, I need to double check the documentation and see what they assume about it. Um, and, you know, when you look at the total resource cost, the takeaway is that you can deploy full electrification and generate savings by better matching production to load with this kind of model. So the question that's underneath that is how do you parse that? Did you just valley fill with, for example, electric vehicle load so that you'd have smoothness? Did you valley did you valley fill with storage? Did you valley, you know, this is like you know, there's a there's a good working sort of uh, hypothetical question out there is, is it really, do we, do we have to actually add a whole lot of generating capacity, you know, to electrify some segments or could, or could we just, you know, add it in during the times when we're not using electricity? Now, this model tries to head toward that, but as my graph shows, it doesn't completely flatten demand. Uh, so, you know, you still are likely to have some increments of additional requirements. What's nice about this model is it tells us that each additional increment of additional, you know, each increment of additional load triggers an opportunity to actually save more by deploying a, more of the cost effective resources and, um, and by doing it smartly and in a targeted fashion. So, um, I'd have to, like I say, I'd have to check. I don't think it assumes B to grid deployment or, or production of energy, but I'll check. Great, thank you. Um, Deborah Rowe, U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development at District of Columbia asks, um, has NARUC or other key organizations valued, sorry, validated the integrity of this modeling? Um, I have a feeling that it's been validated in many ways, but that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, and did you, who was it asking who validated it? Um, Deborah Rowe was asking, has NARIC or any other key organization been validated? Yeah, um, of course, the only validation is to live the next 10 years or 30 years of our lives and see if we do it and whether it works out, right? I mean, this is a model, this is a, this is a roadmap, and it, you know, we choose to deviate or take a side trip or not not even start the trip, then, you know, we can't be validated. We have, we gather criticisms and credit questions. Uh, Chris Clack and the team have responded to some critiques that some people have put up. Um, and he keeps that dialogue going I know there was a, a Twitter, uh, it's fun to follow Vibrant Clean Energy because they post some really cool results. There was some Twitter dialogue explaining how the model worked and why some assumptions about it that came out of the Haas Institute out in California were not correct. Um, but it is, it's sort of, ultimately this is about sort of scientific inquiry and people saying, but did you consider or or did you consider it this way? And um, that the community is sort of is sort of going and doing that. I don't know. In, in, in at some level, I don't know of an actual validation for this other than use it, its use. And we're at the early stages. We're we're investing in these runs to encourage people to try it. Uh, we think like. Uh, we think that, you know, based on, well, let, let me put it this way. Um, most of what I just shared with you is not actually that new, right? When you think about how you would expect right size resources to operate in the grid, we've been saying this stuff since well before we published Small is Profitable. This stuff goes back to studies like the Kerman substation project and, and other work done by Tom Hoff and Howard Winger and Dan Sugar 
when they were all working for Carl Weinberg at PG&E and, and bunches of other research projects that were done. We know from things like value of solar analysis that when you disaggregate rate elements and do a benefit cost analysis, and especially if you do it consistent with the guidance from the National Standard Practice Manual for Distributed Energy Resources on Benefit Cost Assessment, we know these resources have superior value in the individual kilowatt, in the individual installation, especially if you're wise about location and temporal uh, value streams. What we've been able to do with this supercomputer analysis is analyze the system-wide impacts of optimizing distributed energy resources and asking the fundamental lease cost question. Can optimizing distributed resources reduce the system cost if those resources are deployed or at least available system-wide? And the answer is yes. Distributed resources scale nicely into utility scale resource planning. Um, and I don't know any reason that that premise and that that result that we've seen in this modeling and has been seen in other modeling would not be valid except for execution, which there's execution risk on everything. Great. Well, it's clearly an amazing and sophisticated model. Um, to end, a couple of people have asked basically, you know, how do we get this out there? Megan Shumway says, how do we get the utilities to run different models? Currently, you know, they're trying to gut net metering, and we all know about that. And Deborah Rowe also mentions, you know, that we may lose the House and even the Senate to Republicans. Let's hope not. But, you know, how do we get um, conservatives or really any politicians to get, you know, to see, at least see the results of this modeling and appreciate it. I, and, and, and the short answer is um, two things, you know, first of all, don't be afraid to talk about this. There is nobody in, nobody on this call and none of your friends are, are unqualified to discuss this, to talk about how, wow, you know, um, this guy, put on this presentation, there was a lot of gobbledygook words, but basically it said that, gee, homegrown tomatoes can be safer, healthier, and more affordable than those you buy from the supermarket. Um, and home growing your electricity seems to work the same way. Uh, that makes sense to me, you know, and more people was, and talking about that and saying, yeah, I think you're right, I think it does. Uh, then the second thing is to get involved. Um, if you're a solar owner or want to be, get involved with organizations like Solar United Neighbors and coalitions like this one and other groups that allow you to do this. Express your opinion. Say, I heard about this. You know, there's public speaking opportunities at every regulatory proceeding. Um, and people can get together either as through the clubs and organizations they're members of or as individuals to say, I think you ought to look at this um, because that's really what it takes. This, you know, I'm a veteran of the externalities war. I got into the first one in the 1990s or the first one I remember. And I, what has always amazed me is how quickly people just grab that idea. That's, you know, it's like, wow, this is kind of kitchen table economics here. Um, if I don't spend all my money, I, and send all my money away, I get to keep more of it, you know? And if I consider all the aspects of what I spend my money on, I make different decisions. And, you know, this is, um, this, that's the same thing here. If I invest in my community and its energy resource capabilities, my community will be stronger. And wow, it might even be so strong that it pays dividends. That's what this modeling says. We're all entitled to communicate that message to all the decision makers at, in whatever office they have. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. This has been another really excellent presentation. Thanks to everyone who's still with us. And uh, again, we will send you the recording and slides in the next couple of days. Thanks very much, Carl. 
All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.